All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November 2024 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Crim Advisory Panel on Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice Systems. Um, we will begin by doing some introductions, but I'm also going to wait because at the end of it, there are a few people that um, we need to introduce and Julio is going to do that. So let us begin. Dale, can you introduce yourself briefly, please? Good evening. I am Dale Manning. I am a citizen of the Nolhegan Band of the Kufic Abnaki Nation. Great. Thank you. Julio? Sure. So I'm, I'm, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Julio Thompson. I'm an assistant attorney general and director of the Civil Rights Unit. And um, I've been an interim member of the RDAP uh, on behalf of Attorney General Charity Clark, but joining us on the call and actually who started the call today uh, is, is my colleague Todd Delos, who recently rejoined our office to serve as the legislative and policy director uh, as part of our front office and di directly reporting to the chief of staff uh, in the attorney general's office who will be assuming the seat uh, in RDAP. Uh, Todd can introduce himself all he wants. Um, I, I met Todd, I guess it was uh, maybe 10, over 10 years ago, you were in our yeah. office, for, maybe from 2011 or 2012 through the end of A.G. Sorrell's tenure. And so we worked together then. Uh, he left to go work in state colleges as uh, their legal counsel and then over to the Agency of Human Services as their general counsel and ultimately became de deputy secretary. That's why I see some smiles on the screen because people know Todd well and, and be probably better or at least more recently than me. Um, but uh, the agency uh, or our office's legislative policy director is really a new position that the AG uh, created to uh, be kind of the contact point for uh, policies initiatives that our office is interested in and also managing our legislative portfolio, um, which will start uh, in January. So I'll leave it to Todd to, to say anything else before. I'm, I can't, I couldn't add to that. Can you? I couldn't add to that, Julio. Thank you. That's a, I'm mostly impressed that you knew my uh, my resume that well. But uh, it's good to be here. I look forward to learning a lot more about the work of this panel uh, and and hopefully amplifying that work as best as I'm able in this current position. Lovely to see some familiar faces, and I look forward to getting to know other folks as well. Great. Thank you both. Barzana, welcome back. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so for Zana Leva, Orleans County State's Attorney. Okay, thank you. Tyler? Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for the Family Services Division and the Commissioner-Appointed Designee from the Department for Children and Families. Pleasure to be here tonight. Oh. Derek? Hi, good evening, Derek. Mio Dubnik, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the Vermont Department of Corrections as Commissioner Nick Demmel, designee, and my role within the Department of Corrections is to uh, be responsible for the overall administration of our community and restorative justice um, scope of work, which includes our uh, transitional housing programs and restorative justice programs and internally uh, capacity building around restorative practices. Nice to see folks. Susanna. Hi, good evening, everybody. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Thank you. Judge Morrissey. Good evening, my name is Mary Morrissey. I am the Judiciary's representative on the committee. Tyler, thank you for directing me back to the right meeting. Um, I, I can never remember which one we're supposed to be a part of. I was alone in the other uh, the other meeting until Tyler directed me back. So appreciate the help. Thank you. Sheila. Uh, Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns, uh, panel member and co-founder and executive director okay. of the Root Social Justice Center. Thank you. Representative Arsenault. Hi there. I'm eating dinner. 
Ah! <laughs> I was like, oh, now I can get a couple bites in. Um, I'm Angela Arsenault, representative from Williston. I am a member of the House Judiciary Committee and um, uh, am kind of a, not a panel member, but uh, certainly a, a very interested observer of the panel's work um, and here as the Judiciary Committee's Mm, eyes and ears let's say so thanks okay tiffany hi Tiff tiffany northreet hi Aton. hi um, sorry <laughs> you're fine you're fine uh tiffany northreet here from ore um division of racial justice statistics i am not a panel member okay laura Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Carter. I am a data analyst in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics within the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Christine Hughes. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Eitan. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Derek. Hi, everyone. Jeez, what a huge group. Um, <laughs> I am the director of the Richard Kemp Center in the old north end of Burlington and a retired uh, panel chair. Right. She was the inaugural chair, as a matter of fact. Well, I sure was um, back in E.J. Donovan's days. Right, right, back then. Reverend Hughes, hello. T.J. who? Yes, well. I'm Mark. I'm, I'm the executive director of Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and also I am sitting over on the Land Access Opportunity Board and Health Equity Advisory Commission in, in RJ SAC. Cool. Good evening. Thank you. And last but not least, Anthony Jackson Miller from ORE. Uh, yes, Anthony Jackson Miller, data analyst with ORE, along with uh, Laura. Great. Great, great. Thank you all. Good evening. Um, we are, we've got a bunch of stuff. It was a little bit difficult to um, get everything in that I wanted to get in. As I said about five minutes ago, this can either go for like three hours or about, you know, one. So who knows? We'll do, we'll, we'll find out as time goes on. I'm sorry about the team's invite still being there. Um, I don't know why it is. Neither does Ann Walker. Nobody seems to know why it can't go away. I don't, I love computers. They're really so wonderfully helpful. Um, and, and you know, the internet's just a marvelous thing. And as Sheila has just said, it's windy and it is down here. And so her internet's a bit unstable. Um, so just know that. Um what else do I have to announce? Um, Rebecca Turner is going to be in and out. She had some unavoidable childcare issues come up that she needs to obviously deal with this evening. The minutes are my fault. It didn't get all. There was a miscommunication between um, Grant and I. Um, and that was a problem. And so you didn't get the minutes. So don't think you had them and you just don't know what's going on. That's a horrible feeling. I no, you're, you're all fine. It just didn't happen. It's on me. Um, I will, as soon as that gets ironed out, they'll be to you as soon as I can. Please believe that I do apologize most humbly, but it was, it's been a bit crazy here. Um, next announcement is I had got ahead of a list. No, I don't. Um, we are going to start this evening with the discussion, continuing discussion, um, concerning the proposed legislation regarding the impact assessment inventories that we were talking about. Um, and here's Rebecca now. Um, that, I, as you all had asked, um, Representative Arsenault and I have talked about it. She's still very, you know, much wants to sponsor that. 
Um, we need to pull all of the ideas together because there's a lot here um, to be thought about. One of the things that I've been particularly obsessing on is who's going to do this? Who sifts through the legislative pile? <laughs> what else does one call it? Tsunami. Um, and goes through the pile and pulls out the bills that definitely or even might have an impact on what our title says we do, right? Racial inequities, that sort of racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system. Um, I get upset sometimes and I'm like, but why don't we talk about this? You know, I mean, this happens in education. Da, da. Sheila and Jeff usually are the ones who smack me, you know, that's metaphorical, upside the head and go, hi, race, dear, that's what we're doing. Um, and we're doing criminal and juvenile justice. That's what we're doing. We're not doing everything. I'm very grateful for when that happens because I lose sight of that sometimes. Um, but we need to get those bills to us because, of course, one of the big problems is that the RDAP and the legislature are really in certain ways incompatible. Mostly, in my view, the RDAP meets for two hours once a month. And technically, if we're really, really obedient, we're only supposed to meet 10 times per year, not 12. Um, I know, I, I, I know Susanna, I, <laughs> I know. Um, everyone's got great ideas. Um, the other problem then being that the legislature's part-time. And they race through everything, as we all well know, as fast as they possibly can. Um, and that there's a there's a there's a discontinuity there, and there's a problem. And in order to, in my view, fulfill what this panel was set up to do, that discontinuity needs to be confronted, and it needs to be confronted basically now. Um, there's no point in waiting any longer. I will just openly say I don't have the life force to make it through another session like last session. I just don't. Where nobody contracted the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Nobody contacted the RDAP. In fact, I'm having a very hard time finding anyone who was contacted for testimony, who is not a government actor, but who is concentrating on social justice, purely social justice. I don't put the ACLU in there. The ACLU is about civil liberties and about defending things in the Constitution, even though they seem to lose their way every so often. Um, they got to testify. Other Nobody else did. And there was a tsunami of bills that went through last session that had the potential for serious racial disparities and impacts from those. Um, I don't have it in me to do that again. That was so depressing. Um, and that's why I'm hoping we're looking at this bill. Um, one of the big issues, of course, had to do with um, who is going to sift through the raft of information um, through the bills as they come about. Um, I, if you remember my, e not my last email, but the one before that, all of a sudden at the end of it, I tacked on an addendum saying, well, there's that advisory panel uh, that the Division of Racial Justice Statistics is to have. Can this possibly be a task of theirs? Um, I mentioned it to Susanna. Um, Susanna, why don't you talk a bit about that whole situation right now? Yeah. Um, do you want you want me to give an update on the RJ SAC? Sure. Go for the whole thing. Yeah. So um, just for a little bit of background for those who maybe were not here during that time. Um, I want to say 2022, the legislature, uh, well, 21, 22-ish, the legislature asked the RDAP 
to consider, to, to report back to it, um, to describe whether, where, and how to set up an uh, entity that they were at the time referring to as a Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, because they had confronted and gotten frustrated with the fact that we always want data, 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 and there does not seem to be, there did not seem to be a centralized place. Thank you, Laura, for putting the bill uh, in the chat. A centralized place where we could find it all. So they asked the RDAP to generate a report on that. The RDAP used its own members and consulted with, uh, oh, two reports. Um, the RDAP used its own members and also consulted with outside experts, including data experts and people in the criminal legal system. Um, and developed a report that said, hey, in order to do this, you need five staff, you need this data infrastructure, you need databases, you need et cetera, et cetera, you need public facing, dash facing dashboards, et cetera. Um, that all got turned into a bill. Of course, the negotiation and compromise process ended up making it look a little bit different when it came out than what the RDAP had recommended. But nevertheless, a division of racial justice statistics was created and it was housed in the Office of Racial Equity, which you know uh, sits in the agency of administration. So in addition to that, uh, they did what I really, really, really don't like, which is every new thing that happens in state government, you need another advisory council on it. So there's also an advisory council that was created alongside the division. It is called the Racial Justice Statistics Advisory Council. And that group was to be convened by the executive director of racial equity, hello, um, yeah. And that didn't happen for a really long time for a lot of reasons. I'm not going to bore you with excuses, but uh, this September, we did finally convene the whole group and um, they have now had their third meeting, the first kind of official meeting because it was the first time we had quorum. Um, so that group is up. It is running. We have representatives from seven appointing entities. That is Outright Vermont, AALV. Racial Justice Alliance, an appointee of the governor, Migrant Justice, an appointee of the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, and a seventh, who is great. Uh, come back to that. Um, so that is where we are. I know I'm talking so, so much, but I, I think that it, it was important for people to get caught up because we were a really different group now than we used to. Um, so anyway, that group is running, but it's still very nascent, nascent stages. Um, and so I, I would feel uncomfortable speaking on that group's behalf about whether it would want to accept work because technically I'm not a member of that group. I'm just the help. Um, but I do think that it's worth a conversation because that group does have people who uh, represent different constituent groups and also, you know, some people with data and technical expertise, et cetera. So I hope that that answered the question. Great. Thank you. Um, that was what I could imagine. And um, thank you, Mark, for putting in the chat. Um, and yeah, we pretty much got it there. Um we, I was thinking that that would be a group that could perhaps do this. It would also, given that it is composed of this very diverse group of people across the state, all working for social justice in their own ways, racial justice, um, that they in fact would be good for this kind of work. Um, it's the sort of thing where at some point we're going to have to, you know, I'll, we can invite them in and have a conversation and try to sell them a news car or something like that. But, you know, I think that that's, I think that's worth doing. Um, but I just wanted to bring that up because I think that what we were suggesting and so as for the, um, for bridging this problem for for making this less of a problem between the legislature and the RDAP, this was what I could come up with. And this is and that seems to me a major stumbling block in this is someone has got to get the legislation before us. Um 
and someone's got to be able to do that. Someone's got to be responsible for doing that, et cetera, et cetera. Any other ideas here? Because this is like opened, right? We're trying to get as much information out. And certainly before Representative Arsenault, who at some point will be speaking with Ledge Council um, about what this bill should look like. So I know I'm just throwing this, <laughs> but it's a thought. Does anyone have other thoughts that might occur to you about any other group to which we're connected that can do this? Or do you think that maybe, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Thank you. I'm trying to be mindful of when I speak on these calls. So the um, the RJ SAC, uh, I Honestly, I've only, just as one person who sits on that, I would say um, initially my initial thought and after taking a look at the en enabling statute, it doesn't really look like it fits. Um, okay. It it doesn't. Um, and I and I think the reason why that is, is just because it's it's involving policy and we're really charged with data and advisory. Uh, towards the ledge, uh, towards the legislature, the um, the um, the um, um, Susanna, you'll have to help me with all of those other initials. The the advisory to the data folks in the ORE, uh, Tiffany and them. So I'm gonna start saying Tiffany and them, uh, and um, and also to you, advisory to you, uh, yeah, DRJF. The other thing uh, that I was thinking is is that I was wondering. You mentioned ledge console, uh, and um, and I think um, Representative Arsenal maybe she might have some insight on it. But I was thinking, could it be that when uh, ledge console produces a judiciary policy, um, if they if they determined, and this might be a Bryn Hare question, uh, if they determined that the um, that the policy was was related to um, that there could be implications, you know, fill in the blank, blah, 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 I'm trying to abbreviate this, then, you know, uh, so on and so forth. I'll leave it there. Okay. Representative, any thoughts to that that you, I know. I'm yes. Thinking, yeah. No, I, I actually have a slide deck, Aton, if you want me to share that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, let me take Susanna's question and then yes. I want to share the slide deck. Please. I love slide decks. Um, I wonder actually if I should hold it for after that. Well, I, I guess I'm sorry. I'm also trying to be really, really mindful of how much I'm, I'm talking in this meeting. The um, I think that, um, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to hold this comment for after uh, the presentation. I thought. Okay. Um, I don't know. Presentation might be an overstatement, but. We'll go with it. <laughs> Do you have, I don't have, which is a good thing. I'm not the host because if that were true, we would never meet. <laughs> um, so whoever is in charge of like giving permission or whatever has to happen. Todd, thank you. Can you give that to the representative? Things that I am barely capable of considering um <laughs> let me see what i can do angela sure because I, I i know there's a button somewhere but yeah so I'm, let's see if i can multiple participants can share simultaneously. try can you share now um you click that green square yeah let's bottom. see okay. let me find the right all right, yeah. hold on. Yeah, I should be able to. I just need this is the the tricky thing where I don't want to show. It's like embarrassing to show how many tabs I have open. So let me. Uh, Unless you have more than one thousand four hundred and ninety seven, you're not the worst person on this. Topic. Oh, check it out. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Um, <laughs> all right, I think this. Okay, I don't know what Zoom is asking me to do something weird, but I'll allow it for one month. Um. Okay, let me see. Yeah, this should work. Great. Can y'all see that? It says racial justice. Yeah. Yep, there it is. Okay. 
So, oh wait, I, I should go. This is ta-da! I have a title card, um, <laughs> and yeah. So this is three potential paths and incomplete list, uh, and this is a, a really quick overview, basically, of a conversation that Aton and I had uh, last week or the week before. Mm -hmm. So you've just gone through the first potential path, I think, Aton, um, with some really helpful information as well from Susanna. So um, this is that option where we empower. And as Reverend Hughes said, like, I think it would take something, it would take a, a an amendment, a little, little bill to empower the council to, um, you know, select bills for review and then complete the assessment. And oops, oh my gosh, look at that. I have a spelling error in my first ever. Oh, well. Advise, not advice, advise the relevant relevant legislative committees. Um, that's kind of, that's one path that Aton has outlined. And then a second that we talked about was relying on the committee of jurisdiction, members of the committee to um, perform the impact assessment, utilizing, uh, ostensibly utilizing a specific tool, whether it's the one, um, I know the Office of Racial, Office of Racial Equity has a, a tool, I think, if I remember correctly, it was being it was being updated or worked on a little bit recently. Um, and so this could be a, this was like the very broad option, like all bills being taken up for consideration, undergoing this uh, impact assessment um, in across every committee, which understandably, as Aton was saying, is not the scope of work of of the RDAP, but could be what I think could still be what the R, what the RDAP um, suggests or recommends to me as a as a requester of the bill. Um, and then a third option would be that only certain committees would be required to to utilize this assessment tool. And I just, I threw out some, you know, House and Senate Judiciary, House and Senate Housing, House and Senate Healthcare. And as I was thinking about the committees, I was like, oh, it's hard to figure out. <laughs> GovOps, absolutely, yes, 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 yes. It's hard to know like where to stop because you, we know that these inequities exist everywhere across all kinds of policies. So that's another option. It's narrowing the scope. Right. Um, but utilizing, you know, the same tool, presumably. And then as I was thinking about this, I came up with another option. Um, and I thought, what if House and Senate appropriations were required? Like if we wanted to go like an, incre an incremental, take an incremental route. Um, I was trying to think about, you know, the budget as this ultimate value statement, um, is that a place? And that that really deviates under like deviates from the RDAP's mission, I think, and and scope. So just just throwing it out there. And as I said, I, I can see how this this idea has drawbacks because it is so narrow. Um, but I'd be really interested in how that how such an assessment would uh, what what it would show us about how we as a state allocate funds. Um, then I came up with another one. <laughs> um, and it's exactly, I think what you were just, what you were getting to, uh, Reverend Hughes, that um, thinking about where in the process this assessment needs to happen. And I wondered if this actually kind of gets to another issue, which is that we as legislators tend to request too many bills. <laughs> and yeah. legislative council is they are overworked um, and there are no guardrails. Um, that's a whole other issue. But interestingly, if if folks were required to assess a bill that they've requested um, using a tool that we as legislators would be trained on, um, I wonder if with help from legislative council and, and, and maybe joint fiscal office, um, that assessment at that like drafting stage would re could result in a report that's presented along with the bill when the bill is introduced in committee uh 
I, you know, I could, even if it's, I'm thinking like a cover sheet, um, with, with every bill, with every bill or with maybe again, we can narrow within this scope narrowed to, you know, judiciary and gov ops and, you know, you could play around with that, but that's another idea. And it gets me to the last slide, which is, which, which would be like my questions for all of you. Um, I guess, in addition to the big question of what, you know, who should be doing this assessment. Um, I'm wondering about implementation. I spoke with coach and um, representative Christie and representative Rachelson who, who tried to, who did introduce something similar a few years ago. And, and coach was really clear that there is a general, there's agreement that something like this is needed and that the, um, the delay comes up when you talk about how to implement it. Um, at what point along the process, you know, uh, of, of a bill becoming law, at what point is an assessment like this most effective? Um, you know, for instance, if you, if the assessment is done when the bill is introduced, it's going to get changed a lot, but of course, if the assessment finds that changes are needed, then that's a good thing. Um, but you want to be also be assessing the most, you know, the version of the bill that is going to go to the floor. So maybe you wait till later in the process, but then you don't want to miss the opportunity to make changes. So I have questions about that. What sort of training should be required? Um, I really do think that all legislators should be receiving training on this tool as part of our we get trained on all sorts of other things. Um, and those trainings happen every summer, every um, at the start of the biennium and summer every year. So um, I don't see why this should be any different. And then how to resolve inequities that are discovered, you know, what sort of guidance would help support legislators, you know, or committees in, in making those necessary changes? Where would you, where would we look and I know there's there could be a hundred answers to that, um, but maybe some anchor points um, to get that right. And that's it. Oh, I should have made like a, one of those cute like this is the end of the slide thing. That <laughs> <I have. laughs> Thank you for that, Susanna. You. Do you want to ask? What do you? Is this a good time for you to come in? Yeah, I um I'm I'm I just wanted to kind of share some thoughts that I had, but I didn't want to um overshadow or sort of preempt anything that the representative was, was going to share. But I did have some thoughts. Um I think that so we're talking about a couple of things, right? One is we're talking about how is the art app going to be solidly and reliably looped in on legislative matters and policy matters as they arise. And then the other one is, how is policy going to be assessed for equity implications? And of course, the sector that most pertains to this group's work is criminal legal stuff. But of course, the, the conversation, you know, it deserves a sort of broader scope. So I think on that point, I you heard me say this before, I think that um, an IA tool should be required but I, I am really hesitant about who should be doing it. Um, on the one hand, I think if you're going to be proposing bills, you should do the work. However, not everybody has the same skill level or background needed to be able to do quality assessments. You're going to have a wide variation in, in that quality and in um, how in-depth, not to mention if you want to get your bill passed, I mean, you're going to look at something in the light most favorable to you yourself, uh, and that could come at the detriment of, of oppressed people. So, you know, it makes sense to have it done sort of centrally, although that also does take responsibility off of the proponent. I recognize that, but there's a lot of considerations um, to make there. Maybe it's like one person in ledge council has a um, portfolio that's like, I have education and social services, and I do all the assessments for topics related to, I, I don't know. Um, but I also acknowledge that ledge council is understaffed and we would need to really seriously consider beefing that. So that's on that point. The first point I'll being looped in and who should really liaise with this group. 
I'm I'm gonna say this, Tiffany, please don't be mad, but I, I think it probably makes sense that we we take we commit to doing some of that only because our office already is involved in policy matters generally in the legislature, which is going to include stuff in the art apps wheelhouse. And we have a division that's specifically geared toward this topic area. And we're supposed to report monthly to the art app anyway by statute. So it seems to me like it makes sense that some of that reporting also include proposed policy matters. Um, so, and, and our office has three seats on this group. So it, it kind of makes sense that we at least volunteer to be one leg of the stool that's keeping the art app up to date on policy. The other thing that I wanted to say about this is even if we do have maybe someone from the legislature or, or whoever feeding this group information about, hey, this might pertain to your work or this might pose racial equity implications, I strongly recommend that if we rely on that, we also have a backup because you, not for nothing, but you can't always trust just because a person coming from that venue tells you, no, no, this isn't racist, we promise. Um, I, I would feel better having a second opinion. So I think it makes sense that maybe we, we look at a multi-thing approach. Let me add in there that if we go that route, um, in my function as chair, I would um, help with that. I don't know if that is a hindrance or a help, but I'm liking to think that I could be helpful and that I could just be another brain who could help ORE go through it if needed. So just that's, I'm just putting that out there. The, the other, um, I have a really strong feeling that I can be talked out of that is, I think the ind the legislators who put forth the bill should be responsible for completing the tool. I I mean I know the tool. It's not hard. It's it's really not that difficult to understand. Um I think they should get to a point not simply from the standpoint of labor but from the standpoint of actually learning about the impacts of the legislation that you propose. And I think they should be responsible for completing these things. And then someone else, like DRJS plus a few other folk, whoever that may be, look at them, um, at what they've come up with, and be the other set of eyes to look at this. I do not trust, I, and this may be my problem, and if so, I'll shut up, but after last session, I don't trust anybody in that off, in that building anymore. No, well, that's not entirely true, but not many. Um, that was ridiculous. That was ridiculous, and it had impact. There have been jobs that have been open around the state um, that BIPOC people won't take. And I've asked people why they weren't thinking about applying. And I was told, did you see what they did last session? They didn't listen to a damn thing anybody had to say. And so this has an impact, whether the legislature wants to admit it or not. What happened last session had the, at least in certain localized spaces, the effect of shutting BIPOC people down. They just didn't want to participate. I would hope that's not the point of government, um, at least in Vermont. Um, and I, I, I just think that uh, they really, that the legislators themselves, after the bill is written, should go through it then that's the set that would be the next thing. This is what I'm thinking. And um, representative, I may be nuts. I admit that openly. But what I, I mean, my dream is that they would then, after writing it, go through and fill out the equity impact assessment. It would then go to the next body that would look at it critically and look at their work and be able to say, yeah, no. <laughs> No, yeah, whatever. 
that's my thought for this part of it. Everything else is next. So I'll stop talking. Yeah, no, Aton, I totally respect that. And um, I, I, that's, I think that's what I, I think, feel like that's where I've arrived as well. Like as I was walking, walking and talking into my phone and like writing the text for the um, slideshow that I was like, wait, why? It didn't feel right to me to have to place this burden on someone else, especially another, uh, uh, perhaps especially um, the advisory council, considering they have their responsibilities and it feels a lot like asking folks from marginalized identities to, mm -hmm. again, do the work. Right. To help the majority, you know, the like those in non-marginalized identities, it just, it doesn't feel right to me. But right. if, 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 if that, if they wanted, if the council wanted the work, that's a different story. But, um, so anyway, as I was walking, I was like, wait a minute, I guess it, uh, yeah, it's gotta be the legislator and it's gotta be with some help. Yeah. Um, and, and it's gotta be presented at the time of the, that the bill is introduced that it yes. would that it would that there'd be a, it's not just you do it and then you you're like yeah i did it there has it to be an, an outcome there has to be a report just and again it's some, it's, it doesn't have to be complex um no it loses its impact if it's at any other point in time yeah i think it's like it's it's a it's a raising of flags i, I I, it, yeah, it's just like, hey, you guys might want to. I'm. It's it's even a it's a humble moment, you know. It, 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 if done right, I think for a legislator to bring it forward and say like, I requested this. We have this draft. We've done this assessment, and now we realize there are some issues with it. I hope you, you know, committee of if, if, committee of jurisdiction. I hope you will look into this. Please look into this right. because then that's the committee's responsibility. It's not saying that the sole that single legislator has to fix the issues, but you have to at least be aware when you're presenting something that you hope will become a law. <laughs> like right. we're talking minimum kind of, you know. Yeah, this is minimal, right? This is minimal I mean, expectations here, I think. Right. At, a, at a bare minimum, let's not introduce legislation that is that is going to have a, a racial or other, you know, um, dis disparate impacts. Like let's try to fix them right. if we are aware. Yeah. So anyway, that's where I feel I am now as well. Great. Derek? Derek yeah, I have eight. sort of two kind of half-baked questions. Um, one sort of lands in the legislative branch space and one more in sort of the executive branch space. Um, as maybe an interim and maybe an ongoing measure legislatively. And, and maybe these questions don't merit even answers right now, Representative, but I'm wondering if we can at least make transparent for the public a designation about legislation that comes to the floor for a floor vote about has it received an equity assessment or not. And if it goes through, then at least Vermonters have a record of saying, okay, you know, and maybe that falls to the chair of those committees. You know, maybe it creates some causal accountability or at least transparency. I, you know, I would hope it would translate to accountability, but I'm going to set aside that hope um, because it doesn't seem particularly well-founded in this moment in time, but just the same, some designation that at least can generate the, be a catalyst for participatory informed democracy relative to, to the fact that like this committee insisted on this and this didn't. So that's just one open question again, not looking for an answer and then toggling over to the kind of insofar as ORE sits you know, within the executive branch and, and Susanna, I hear you graciously <laughs> at the chagrin of your staff <laughs> say, I mean, maybe we should be. So 
I, you know, the, the open question I have is insofar as the ORE has created this uh, infrastructure of equity liaisons across all departments, and I understand RDAP and the purview of it really would con concentrate more around racial disparities in the criminal legal system. So perhaps it wouldn't be uh, appropriate or imaginable for the equity liaison for, you know, uh, from a totally different department to participate, or maybe it would, but I guess the broader half-baked question is, can that, that sort of, can, can the ELs sort of serve as like a deputized and, you know, extra capacity to serve that, uh, that function that obviously would otherwise already uh, be way too much for the RE to add to its plate, you know? And again, I'm not even looking for answers. I'm just, I think out loud, sorry, it's just what I do and I want to respect people's time. So. Yeah. <laughs> Susanna, is that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that and I really appreciate it. Um, during the session, we have a weekly call, uh, check, optional check in with the equity liaisons just on legislative stuff. Hey, what are you hearing? What's going on? What has equity implications? What should we be watching? Um, so I think that that could, that could be really helpful. Um, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear with this group. What I'm not doing is volunteering the ORE to do impact assessments for all these bills. I'm volunteering us to make sure you all know about the bills. Um, chances are we're gonna end up doing a bunch of impact assessments anyway um, on some of them, but just wanted to make sure that that I said that. But I do love the idea of, of having the equity liaisons be more involved um, in that. I think somebody somewhere will manufacture a conflict because members of the admin are expected to be on message on certain points. And this is a group that is not advisory to the administration. And um, somehow we're supposed to believe that that creates tension um, in the pursuit of justice and equity. So I'll just put that there for people who are into that kind of thing. Okay. Um, Mark has a point he'd like to make now. Yeah, um, so so this is good. And uh, first, I wanted to um, uh, thank um, Representative Arsenal because that that was a that was a really good way to open everything up. Uh, so that was awesome. Thanks. the The thing that um, thing that I'm thinking is is a couple things. Um, Aton, go is, for it. One thing is is that this the scope of the RDAP. I'm thinking about the scope of the RDAP, and then I'm also thinking about that broader conversation that we were having about all policies. And it reminded me of um, Act um, Act 54 in uh, 2017, um, and that was um, there was a section that's in the white books right now um, that went over to the Attorney General um, as and the Human Rights Commission as a task. It was the um, the task force is what they called it, and it was a report. That's for, right. Uh, and Karen. Uh, was was at the HRC at the time. Karen was at the HRC, remember? Yeah. And, and um, so David Schur, uh and uh, um, and Karen wrote a report. I think I re I, re I recommend that this group go back and take a look at it. Yeah. But now I want to stress that it is beyond the scope of the RDAP, um, but it but it still uh, is related to racial disparities. Uh, and if we're talking about policies, uh, if I can use the term writ large. Uh, policies, uh, then, then that would be it would be relevant that we should make sure that we've got everybody on the bus if 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 we're having that conversation. So, so big at the HRC should probably be notified of this conversation and be yes be pulled into this conversation and and should be uh, somewhere in a workflow uh, or something like that. I I think. Um, Thank I think, you. I think big was also tasked with advising this body, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so um, I don't wanna overspeak that one. Um, the other piece as far as um, the folks being on the bus is um, here within 
um, within this body, it seems like um, when policies come out, uh, I should say um, within, again, across the board, when policies come out, if we're talking about anything that alleged council is going to do, and I alluded to it earlier, then Bryn Hare needs to be on the bus. So just make, all I'm doing is, is I'm just suggesting who we need right. to add to this conversation. Um, Thank you. So it would be really important that Bryn would be a part of, you know, the larger discussion. Um, right. And then the other point that I was going to make is, is that <clears throat> I think it's an excellent idea for legislators to have the primary responsibility upon initiation of any policy to, to run a cursory review. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there, it would be also amazing if that same process or a similar process would take place in ledge consult for validation or verification or just a cross check or something like that. Uh, and then once it's in committee, obviously there, there could be another step you know, if it comes down off the wall or as it comes down off the wall. Um, regarding risk, and I think that's the word that we should probably be using now is, is risk. Um, from a previous life, what I've learned is, is you can, you can either accept it, transfer it, or mitigate it. You can either accept risk, transfer risk, or mitigate risk. And I think that those are some of the considerations that could be made uh, and documented. Uh, in the passage of any policy that uh, carried with it risk associated with creating further disparities. Um, you know, and, and I won't get into what any of those three look like. I'll just leave that to your imagination and maybe something we can talk about another time. Right. But, but definitely one thing we can't do, we can't be, what we can't allow to happen with risk is that it be ignored because that, that should not be an option. <clears throat> And finally, um, what I would say, I can't believe I'm so concise in what I'm talking about. Usually I'm, <laughs> in, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to stay on point. Um, the, the, the other thing is, is that it's the elephant in the room, and I think, uh, and Tuzana um, uh, alluded to it a, a little bit ago, is, is you know, how do we go about um, creating in this process um, the ability for this body to do its work unimpeded? Uh, by its political structure, uh, because that is, if having done all that you can do, at the end of the day, um, uh, and I'll just start pointing at you, each of you, you, my friend, still work for Matt, you, my friend, still work for John, you, my friend, still works for, and I could go on, um, Chris, or, you know, there's a whole list of them, um, and, and at the end of the day, that's what it really all boils down to and i think i just want to be really really sober not critical but sober about that because mm -hmm. you are in some way or another captured which is why i am considering modifying your enabling statute proposing a modification to your enabling statute and i would love some ideas and thoughts off the record on what that might look like but if we don't address that in some manner, then I don't know how impactful at the end of the day, this entire exercise is going to end up being. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca. Yeah, I, I really appreciate Mark's point right there. I've been hearing everyone's um, thoughts and comments. And, and what I want to weigh in is, I think the most important, important thing is, is, you know, whether or not this process is automatic, automatic with maybe a pilot kicking off with certain committees or ha what have you, and the funding implications and staffing and sourcing, I think two key points uh, have already been raised. I just want to join in a independence on the ultimate assessment. Otherwise, it's worthless, absolutely worthless. And so to jump on what some of the ideas or suggestions are. Uh, there was talk about RJSAC, which again was built into um, ORE for the data statistics. I'll just share my perspective of that design of a council made up of community members uh, that were across the board, that were not staff members of ORE, that were not appointees of, of the governor. Right, that we're not we're not part of state government. The point of having that embedded in ORE 
uh, as, as we envisioned in RDAP and designing this data statistical um, entity was independence. And there was a lot of talk about actually getting it outside the administration, getting it into an independent state government body. We floated the, the Secretary of State's office. We floated the auditor's office. Auditor. Uh, yeah. ORE, we recognized, was embedded in the administration. And as much as, as and, and Susanna knows this from how I feel about her personally, but you know, this is not about the personal, the person at the head of these organizations, it's about the structure. And so again, picking up on Mark's point, I think that any assessment tool that's designed has to be done independently. Otherwise, otherwise it will become a tool used against the, the point that we're trying to make, right? How much data? Who's bringing the concerns up? Was this a rubber stamp or not? Just to clear a checkbox. The second is that however this ultimately is a structured, how big it is, how it's funded, who does the actual assessment, Derek talked about this and others. Transparency is key. Uh, the Defender General's Office last year, we also were a frontline witness to how disturbing it was in addition to my membership on this panel and seeing how RDAP didn't get, but just to share, the Defender General's Office was not included in um, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee on key bills and we expressed an interest and we just weren't invited. My point is, is that no matter, so it's not just a simple matter of government, non-government. I think that we in public defense sort of sit in this weird place where we represent individuals, but we are obviously a state entity. My point is this, while there is this process of developing a bill that can pass through and get funded and executed, that's the ideal goal. While that's happening, we don't have to wait for the big bill to, to go through with it. My hope is that any request of any bill that's before the legislature where this is that is racial assessment tool, uh, racial assessment, impact assessment be done, that that be recorded. Whether it comes from the Defender General's office, whether it comes from RDAP, whether it comes from ORE, ACLU, any one of us on this panel, right? Individually in our capacities, that there is some record and as Derek made a point, at the end of it, before final passage, was there actual requests made? And if so, was there then the NES attempt for assessment? If so, what was it? So the whole thing being transparent, just again, to provide that checks and balances. That's all. Great, okay. I is seven and one. We've got two other things on the agenda and Representative Arsenault has to go shortly. Um, can we think of a couple action points to have done by next meeting? I mean, one thing that I did think of was um, as Mark was talking, um, having HRC come and talk with us and also inviting Bryn Hare as well. Does that make sense for next month? Rebecca's nodding. Aton, did you, are you talking about December or January? I can't December. remember. You take, okay, you are. Ah, I just please, wasn't there is sure. another month here, right? Yeah. Yes, I just wasn't sure if you met in, in December. Oh, okay. I, geez, my God. Sorry. I I'm just, sorry. Got, like what? I'm like out of time. I mean, all right. Yeah. No, December, have them come in and talk as well. Um, and get some feedback. Um, I won't have them just come in blind. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll brief them on what we're talking about. Um, but if that sounds like a good idea, great. I'll work on that. Um, can I ask a question, Aton, about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Why pause? Um, yes, yes. And if if it would be helpful, I don't know exactly how it works with Ledge Council. If if like to if you need me to reach out to Bryn, obviously. you may need to. That's yeah. true. That's true. Right. And our and, next and then just can... loop you in. I think that's right. how it works. They can talk to yeah. whomever we. That's right. I can't can talk, to. talk to them. I keep forgetting that. Um... I don't. That may not be the case, but I. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so if you could do that, that would be great. Um, 
HRC is easy. Um, hold on, I'm reading Susanna's comment. Ah, okay. Um, her point, for those of you who aren't reading the chat, I think that the conversation about having legislators or anyone else at the state house do these is dead on the vine if we don't have a sense of whether the speaker and pro tem are willing to support slash enforce since they can kill a bill they don't like. And we know they can. Yes. And we don't know who the speaker will be. We don't yet. That's a tricky one for sure. And we don't know who party leadership will be or in the house. I'm going to recommend that we keep going a bit. Um, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, recommend that I think that we should probably keep going in spite of the fact that we don't know who the speaker is. Um, we don't have time to sit back and wait. Um, I think we should probably keep going. And then once the speaker manifests, we can have this discussion again with them possibly inviting them oh wait mark says there is a speaker mark do tell well i don't mean to be facetious but there's always a speaker um there we may we may be in a lame duck you know period or something like that but until somebody else is appointed to speaker jill's the speaker okay i mean unless somebody else has a great idea i, I would just think i don't deal with the person that's in place let's do that maybe i'm just naive i don't know i could be wrong well we all could be. Um, let's go with that. That sounds like a good plan to me. Anybody else wanting to? Coach. Hey, Coach. Hey, how are you doing? Holding up. Thank you, sir. You know, sorry, sorry to join late. I was just leaving the uh, rehab facility for Mary, so. Okay. Glad to have you. Well, thank you. So what are some other action points that we need to do? We, we're not set on who we want to look at this. How do we become more firm on that? How do we become more firm on what body does this? Anybody got an idea here? I have an idea here. Go for it. I say we decline to have to give the answer. I say that we actually want the principle, what principles are key, and let the legislators decide on and through the, you know, through the bill, whether there, I know that there are other uh, model legislations out there. And this isn't, we're not the first to think of this meaning state legislation legislatures have done this so perhaps someone can take a look and, and see what's going on but i think the key and is you know and i think we should and can come up with some sort of base base ideas and and suggesting essentially that we take an approach similar to our second look uh suggestions again not doing what we did with the data entity bill so they're between the two spectrums of what rdap has provided the legislature right sort of baseline guiding versus multi-page deep down dives of structure and details. I like that. I won't remember it in 10 minutes, but I really like that. <laughs> I, I'm not to shut anyone else down. I love, I would love to hear. I'm not, I really am. I'm, that was not my goal actually. So please, if anyone did have an idea, but I'm also like others, just tired of being asked to come up with the brilliant finished answers where our job, we can only do so much. Right. But we do have these, the insight with all of us here as to what are the critical components. Right. Um, I like that. I like it too. And I, um, I feel like I, I've, I've taken some notes and I really appreciate hearing from everyone. Oh, 
Sheila has her hand up too. Um, so I'll stop well, talking. Well, go ahead and finish, and then we'll go to Sheila. Well, I I have to. I have about. I'm, I have a seven o'clock meeting that I keep saying I'll be there in a minute. Oh, in a minute. okay, okay. <laughs> um, but I just want to say thank you, and um, I will check the meeting minutes for anything I've missed, and I will um, I will reach out to Bryn. Okay. And you know, part of what Ledge Council can do along the lines of what you were just saying, Rebecca, is that you know they can and would um, look to other states and look to other where this has been done before. And um, so that we might uh, have some idea about the feasibility of implementation and see how it's working in those states and all of that. So um, yeah, that, that, that would be a help and not something that everyone here uh, has to figure out. Great. Great. Thank all you. Right. Thank Sheila. you. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to everybody um, for this conversation. It's been great. And I like the ideas that have floated around and I don't have much to add other than Aton. I really liked um, as a um, person to um, be looking at it with the assessment tool is the person writing the bill. I really like that as the first starting point, it, that that be something that's required. I think that is a good learning tool. I think that is a good skill. And, you know, as a reminder, what we're trying to really do here is create a culture. Right. To check off a box. And so fortunately or unfortunately, most people have to buy into that culture to really successfully make it work. And so that's going to be a process and that's going to take time. Right. Uh, for people to understand it, to be able to implement it, to be able to access it in a way that's useful and and also accurate um, per se. And so I think that being able to start in some place um, is okay. I feel like it should go across all of the thing to things to all the all all the things y'all talked about to all the committees to all the issues because even though we're dealing with the criminal justice system here, we all know that racism exists in all of the systems. And again, this is about a culture. This isn't about the RDAP and what the RDAP is doing over here, even though that is the direct discussion of today because we are the RDAP. This is, it sounds like we don't want to take, we want to be lifted up to be like, hey, we're the RTAP over here. You put us in these positions to have some voice for these things. And in saying that, we are advocating for it to go beyond us. And right. it's not just about whether um, we are involved or engaged. This is something that is for the betterment of the good of the whole of everyone. So, right. including white folks. Right. Um, so... Um, I would really like to see um, as if whatever, <laughs> wherever the assessment tool lands at a beginning phase, I would love to see it land in the person's hands that's creating the bill and that bring to a chair and that go on through there and figure out what that really looks like um, moving forward. I Thank you. I mean, I, I just don't see, yeah, what she said. <laughs> I mean, we can't create a culture without actually bringing everyone in the culture into this. You know, that we're at the end process some here, somehow is not how this should be working. I mean, I really feel strongly that the people who are creating these bills, and we've been talking about this in various silos that we all work in, and I've been either privileged or cursed to sit in on, um, you know, this comes up all the time that we have to get people buy-in. It can't be that race just falls on, you know, the ORE or the RDAP or any other group that is set up like that. It's got to become diffused. If it doesn't become diffuse, it's, it can very easily then still just be checking a box. I'm not saying this solves the problem, but it certainly goes a long way towards it. Anything else? We are obviously going to be revisiting this. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Um, we're going to move on. Workflow. Mark, talk. <laughs> uh, 
I have nothing to say. Just it's just that when you know once once this starts, it's, yeah. it's not going to be about where a physical bill is. It's just where the action is. Sure. You know, so for example, if if something comes out of ledge console and it's like, okay, this <laughs> this could definitely be a little problematic if we're not careful with it. Right. Um, in, in, immediately through workflow. Uh, Tutana's office knows about it. The RDAP knows about it if it's right. related to, you know, so on and so forth. That's all I was thinking. Great. Sort of Thank way. you. It was such a provocative term. And I'm like, uh, uh what, 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 what? <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Okay. Can we move on to, I want to the second item, which is further discussion of rest drops and DCF. Now, for those of you who are wondering why this is on, you will know that we have been working at this, getting a sense of these issues, the rest stops, DCF, the proposed new facility, all that, just to get a sense, this is exploratory. So if you're looking for why are we doing this, it's still exploratory. There are still some questions that people have, and we wanna put those out there. This may end up being nothing. And I think that that would be good, wouldn't it? If we looked at it and kind of went, oh, okay, everything's fine. We don't need to pay attention to this uh -huh. one. That, I would love to have something like that. I know about you all. Um, <laughs> since you're all being quiet right now, I'll just assume that you agree with me because I want you to. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, it's an exploratory moment here. Just pretend we're like doing surgery and we're like making sure that there are no cysts that are problematic. So that's what we're doing. Sheila, would you like to start us off, please? Well, I don't know what to really say because- um, Oh, you I, always I, do. You know, <laughs> I feel like this has been just months and months and I'm like forgetting where we are in the conversation to be really honest with you. Oh. So I would love to hear whatever is left to be said. But what I will say is, you know, um, we both have um, a strong group of youth here in Southern Vermont, Friends for Change and Youth for Change, who have worked together to really um, question and ask and, and, and wonder why we keep on investing in systems that are really false solutions. Um, and we keep on creating, we keep on saying that we don't want to create the things that we keep on creating. And it's just really interesting. Our youth are so good at really pointing that out. And we say that all these things are hurtful or not best practices, or we don't have the resources for this. But then it's interesting when I see these type of things being created, whether it's the rest stop or the other thing, which I forget what the other thing is called. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh. when I um, when I see these things being created, what I see is like, we don't have the money for it. We don't have the resources to support these initiatives, these youth, um, these situations. And then somehow we end up being able to find money if it's connected into the law enforcement to be able to support these issues, whether it's individuals, whether it's entities, whether it's other employment, um, somewhere in the mix um, I feel like police law, um, the entity as a whole, often comes into, whether it's being contracted in some type of way, majorly comes into um, the financial situation. When we say we do not have resources to care for these kids in the way that we say we have values of. So I just like to express that, that some youth have expressed that and are really disappointed. Um, I mean, I think disappointment is an understatement because um, some youth have experienced places like this, um, as well as no people who are in the system that could end up in places like this. And so um, I um, am here to help shed light, but also to be a voice for our youth who are directly impacted individuals. And a lot of them um, having the intersectionality of being people of color, being people with different abilities, being queer and trans youth. And so when we talk about our intersectionalities as well and who is ending up in these systems, it's just really horrible. So um, yeah, I guess I'll, I guess I'll leave it at that and see, and see where we can go from there. Thanks. Okay. Um, I had a question now, I don't know. 
Um, I, Tyler, does, is there anything from DCF that you might want to throw in here? Um, happy to jump in and share. I'm really appreciating Sheila's comments. I, I love Sheila where you took us on the last conversation. I think this is also a healthy conversation to bring up. We've been in it many times. I think youth voice is one of the critical elements to all this where the impacted folks. I think I mentioned to this group that I did have the opportunity to go down there. Um, hear directly from some uh, from some of the youth that had experience with programming, uh, perhaps not the rest stop um, specifically, but uh, with residential programming in general. And you know, I really do have a healthy appreciation for the crux of this problem. When we look at it from a um, kind of values kind of standpoint, uh, DCF is not in the interest in heavily utilizing residential solutions. Um, we are an agency that's kind of put in the position when, when they're is a need for a residential solution. We're trying to find a way to make that residential solution be um, the, the most um, uh, effective way of working with a young person, right? Find the right program, find the right treatment modality, find the right uh, program culture, um, all of those elements. And that's the challenge. And I think also, somewhere in this conversation, when we talk about what sort of residential programs we're building or using or putting emphasis on, we neglect the conversation about the vast majority of our work that is far upstream of the residential conversation. And so I think some of it gets lost in message, too. Um, I, I know I've said, you know, starting with the rest stop piece. I've said this in this group a couple times now, categorically, this is not a placement type that we want to see young people going into. DCF doesn't want it to be happening either, and we kind of avoid it. It's not for the perspective of some of the alternative setting placements are um, uh, you know, utilizing space that law enforcement is down in, down in the southern part of the state there is, um, you know, that we do have one working with a, in the building that the sheriff's office owns. So there, that is part of the conversation. But I think the practice of staffing a case, um, staffing a young person, as opposed to putting them in a care environment where they're going to get the education and treatment that they are deserving and needing, um, is, is wrong. Um, it's, it's not how we want to operate. And so, so much of our energy has been to expanding out a system of care outside of that so that we don't have to rely on that anymore. And I think what is probably not known universally is that we just, the system of care has been so far diminished on every front from community-based placements, from community-based services, um, to residential programs, to secure placement, to all of those things. And so right now we're often just scrambling for solutions that are that are not our preferred solutions. And so I think we're trying to build everything all at once. And that comes that comes with a lot of energetic conversations. So I, this this conversation, we've been through it a few times around, and it always gets really broad. And as it broadens, it generates more confusion, I think, for some folks. And so I sometimes try to piece it into more digestible pieces. Um, but it's hard for me to answer kind of the broad question without without knowing what the more focused questions are, without generating to the confusion, I can say. Sheila? Okay, so Tyler, thank you. So maybe yeah. to help me focus without as much confusion, and maybe sure. I'm just forgetting, because again, we've it's been a long time and a lot of conversations, but you mentioned that you are creating these, um, um, what did you call it, continuation of care? Is that what you've called it? System of care. System of care. Continuum, continuum of care. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, continuum yeah. of care. And so sure. I'm wondering if you've mentioned what that looks like right now. You said like simultaneously, it sounds like you're like, okay, we realize this 
isn't the best. And so we're working on trying to do something better. And I'm wondering what that something better is and what support you need from us to make that better or to move it along. (laughs) Now that maybe that's where we need to focus because if you are ensuring us that we're moving in what the right direction is, and that could be in quotes, um, depending on how you interpret that. Um, And is that, is that work being presented to this group per se for us to look at a look at that? Um, And if so, then how can we support the initiatives? Like we we're in here talking about funding. We're in here talking about assessments. We're in here talking about most impacted and experienced people. We have a wealth of resources and information here um, and we often talk about, again, the adult system. And so in focusing on the juvenile system, what is it that you need from us to move away from the system that I believe is really harming um, our community? I, thank you for that. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to go into what the whole system of care when I say continuum of care. So that kind of starts with how do I empower you, young people to stay in home with their family while they get the treatment they have. And so we have a variety of programs that we can do from an in-home base. And we're looking to expand some of that. We're in the midst of expanding one of it's called support and stabilization. It's a statewide program we're expanding in home care. And then as you talk, when you think continuum of care, that's on one end of the spectrum. Then you have kinship care placements, which we're looking, we're bringing in a kinship navigation model. We've been partnered in it for two years to how do we expand the use of kinship programs. That means a young person is maybe not in their home with their um, their biological family, but they're placed with a relative of the family with grandma, grandma and grandpa are usually the kind of most common kin placements. After that, we think about what foster care placement is, expansion of foster care. How are we wor- working with our um, foster care provider networks? The state isn't the only one who's doing that. Um, uh, after that, we have different levels of residential, pl- or the, actually I should go even beyond that. The Department for Aging and Independent Living utilizes uh, their own care supportive network that is uh, that it's about placing individuals with disability into placement. All of these systems have enormous reductions in what's available. Um, so, you know, from going from 30 care homes for individuals with disability down to seven in the whole state. So we, what we're looking for is folks within the community who can provide care within a home-like environment within the community. I think that is where we're always trying to emphasize. And it kind of keeps going up, up the chain all the way to the very top, which is where we're talking about secure placement for crisis stabilization purposes in the face of a critical incident that's occurred in the community, public safety incident that's occurred in the community. So it's this kind of huge spectrum of things we're talking about, and we're trying to advance all those fronts simultaneously because they've all been reduced at the same time within the past five years. And maybe this is really endemic of a system that's challenged on all fronts. This is coming from an educational system, from correctional system, from law enforcement, whatever it is, I think that is the approach we're trying to take and we're trying to do it with open ears, but we are often kind of on our back foot saying, what do I do about a kid who needs my help today? And I think that's where we keep getting stuck in this rest stop conversation, which is right now I have a kid who needs to be safe. They need to literally be under a roof tonight and there is not a roof to be found in any direction. One thing that I I really do appreciate, uh, we talk about money all the time as being the barrier. I think coming out of the Agency of Human Services, that's always far down the list in conversations. It's about how do we meet the need right here and now, and the money we have to figure out after the fact, but right now we need to find services for this person. Um, And so... It, this isn't about just I'm I'm trying to create something that's going to line pockets somewhere. It's about addressing the need, but we want that need to not be a residential program halfway across the country. We want that need to not be a placement that is just the purposes of a roof without therapy or education um, or other forms of case planning built into their their experience in that. 
it's about having sustained other programming. And I think so much conversation gets lost in, oh, we're trying to build a residential program that will inherently be harmful. Um, it, it, it generates a lot of energy that is not towards, we're not having the conversation of how do I build this in a way that is going to be helpful, that's going to be supportive. How do I bring in those voices that you're talking about that not from the starting point of just don't do it because there is another kid that does need that level. And so I think it's, I, I don't know how to put, a, I don't know how to say this is what I want from you all now, but I, I, I think this is about we're advancing multiple fronts at the same time, and all of it is designed to get care into families. Sheila, are you comfortable with this where we are right now? Or do, do you want, um, what do you need? What yeah, do we need? I mean, in terms of, can you all hear me? Am I freezing? I think my computer. Okay, cool. I can hear you. I'm fine. Okay, great. Um, I um thank you for that. That that's that's really that's really helpful. And that's why I'm asking the question today, because even though um I feel uncomfortable with the current conditions, I understand that there may be other conditions that could be worse and obsolete and and that trying to move forward and working for something better. And so I, I appreciate that uh, a lot. And I think that that's exactly what I'm trying to say in terms of when I'm asking what what does it need what do you need is trying to affirm that I hear you, and so how can we all work together to make the system to make the culture to make the community that mm. that we really want to have, and like be really serious about it. Um, yeah. And so it makes me think of too when you mention all those initiatives, which is you know um, you know great, interesting. You know, I think of like um, what's the work around um, racial equity within those initiatives, and how much does this group know about those initiatives, and how they've impacted mm -hmm. positively or not um, communities of color, and how we could have a voice in those systems that you're improving. Um, mm -hmm. And not that I wanna put more work on us, but I think the two vast categories that we're here for is you all, BCF, <laughs> and the criminal justice system. So I feel yeah. it's really appropriate to be able to say, hey, this is, I believe in our jur jurisdiction to call in and be like, this is a system that we, I think we all know is broken and um or is working for who it's intended to and um and it needs fixing but we all have to sort of figure that out together so so hearing you um yeah. and and you know you might not know what that is now but i would be curious about the programs and how you're looking at, at racial equity in those programming how we could support um various initiatives and appropriations and whatever it might be because sure. you're absolutely right. We we need the skills and we need this skill, qualified and skilled people, but qualified skilled people meet, cost money. <laughs> I've learned that. I run an org <laughs> I run I run an organization and <laughs> hire people. I've learned that for people to do the work, it costs money. And you can get the people, you just have to have the right kind of money. And and so right, we all come on now, let's be real. Yeah. Uh, so so what do we need to be doing better um to yeah. to help advance the initiatives that are going on so i'll stop there tyler i just i mean i just i want to express I, an enormous gratitude for shayla i you brought this conversation up a few times honestly i i also want to make sure i'm really clear i think this conversation is 100 percent appropriate for the rdap i'm grateful to have this conversation in the rdap and I wasn't always sure of what the interest was. When I first joined here, we talked almost exclusively about the adult uh, kind of criminal systems of care and, you know, a criminal justice system. And so I think this is very appropriate. Um, so just a big thank you for, for elevating this. Sorry, I, Eitan, stepped on your Well, time. no, I just wanted to ask you a favor, if you would. Yeah. Um, in a sense, I would like it if you could do an impact assessment inventory, at least in your head, about 
what's going on, not right now, not, not, not right now, but in going forward from this conversation, if you could put, just keep that in mind and bring stuff into the RDAP when appropriate. Because Sheila's doing that. Yeah. I, I mean, is that something you can do? So as we propose initiatives, you know, yeah. internally, this is where that we always have an internal process that starts with that. Um, okay. And I, I do think there is a little challenge to what I just started to open up the floodgates on was this system of care, this is in every direction. This is more, this is as big as the agency and beyond because it's coming from so many directions. It gets really muddy when you try to do a, an impact assessment over something that is so very multifaceted. Yep. But we can certainly do it on in more focused way on pieces of it. Let's, if that if that makes sense. If that's can, what we have to do, then I wrestle have, with that. Sheila, would you agree? I mean yeah, I love the idea of, I mean, I mean, everybody um, here, I think that, and drop it in the chat if you can, Susanna, um, I think everybody here should um, be utilizing it or looking at it or figuring it out. So, and including myself, I'm not as familiar, as familiar with, I've read some of it and this and that, but I, yeah. you know, I think that here we are talking about a tool that, you know, many of us not be, might be that familiar with ourselves and um and then how to apply it to the work that the, we do so yes is the answer to your question Aton. that um, okay i feel as though that would be awesome if if you're looking at those tool assessments and utilizing them in your work great yeah tyler we just have to be in good contact as we are um and bring things to me to put on the agenda and of course. Yeah. great coach I suppose I should be calling you Representative Christie. Sorry. Uh, no need for the formality. Okay. <laughs> been on the planet, been on the planet too long. <laughs> um, that that being said, uh, listening to Tyler, listening to Sheila, and in my cat lives, thinking about the last time I sat in an emergency room for almost 30 hours with a 16 year old young woman who was in crisis. She didn't meet the level of need of a sheriff. DCF really didn't know what to do with her at that point, but because I was working for a partner agency, uh, being NFI at the time, uh, they defaulted to us. And so I ended up spending, you know, that 30 hours with this young woman. And what I learned from that experience about that individual situation is it's all about case management. Because at the end of the day, we were able to finally get a lot of resolution in that case. And what it took was connecting the dots of services. And one of the things that I think that everybody around this table understands that case management is key. Anytime right. that we see a program that's highly functioning, there's usually a high level of case management going on at the same time. So I think there there's a common denominator in that statement. And not to say that it's the solution, but it's part of the answer. Okay. Um, and I just needed to to put that out there because as I was listening to Sheila and, and Tyler, I, it, you know, it just, it just came, you know, to mind. And, and, and that was just one of many, but the other piece of that was I had a very small caseload. Right. You know, my average caseload was 12 young people. And we know that the average caseload of a DCF worker, for example, could be up to 30. 
you know, right. or more sometimes. Sure. But, you know, dealing at that level, you had the, uh, let's say, the bandwidth to really be intersectional for that young person. And I think that that's the key, you know, connecting with the school, connecting with DCF, connecting, you know, with the guardian ad litem, connecting, you know, all of bringing all of those pieces together on their behalf. Right. And that's where, you know, and the, and the final residential piece, you know, be it like Tyler was talking about a kinship placement, you know, an alternative placement, you know, what, what, Ever it might be, but it was all within that purview, you know, of the case management piece. But, anyways, I, I just needed to throw that out okay. into the conversation. Great. If, it, if that's helpful. It is. Thank you. Anyone else before we go on to the last item? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh I want to go back to um, DCF uh, and you know, a couple of things is with, um, with all the data I'm looking at and I sit on the subcommittee, uh, RED, as you know, Tyler, uh, uh, under uh, Karen and Sparks. Um, so I've, and I've been over there for a while and, I, and I'm, I think there's probably like five indicators we're tracking on OJJDP that we report um, and um, it seems like those would be good topics to bring into this body uh, for conversation. Uh, I think that um, I think that respectfully that should be a no brainer um, that this body uh, should should be um, you know involved because that is that's the quintessential disparities in the juvenile justice system. And um, and I think that um, we should we should be watching that here. That'd be I think that'd be a good idea. Number one. Um, number two, I think that um, we also know that. Um, and and honestly, you know, back to that first point, I don't know. I honestly cannot tell you that I've seen those numbers decreasing in the last, and I'm going to say nine years. That's how long I've been watching. I don't know that I've seen those data points going south at all. Um, number two is um, the disparity rate at which black youth are being removed from their homes across the state. Um, I keep going back to point number one because I've, I've, I keep forgetting stuff. Largely, that's Chittenden County, basically. That's that's not those are not statewide numbers, because for some odd reason over the last 10 years, we haven't figured out how to move beyond just counting in Chittenden County, despite the fact that we can't even seem to get that under control. But we're not looking at we're not looking across the entire state, um, which I would say arguably is maybe another 30 to 40 percent of the black kids across the state. Um, so who knows what's going on out there? It's just a black hole. Um, the second point that I keep trying to get to is, is the, the, the disparate rate at which black youth are being removed from their homes. And I would start that conversation with um, calls to DCF. I just got I just got finished looking at some numbers. Uh, I know there's a lot of mandated reporters that are out there and those those numbers um, were. Um, I think somewhere around 2000, you know, for we're hovering up around 2000 for reporting. Um, and the, the numbers there, again, there's just racial disparities across. I'm not going to go into all of the data points, but I'll just say that again, um, this, it'd be a good idea if this body <laughs> is, you know, is mandated to address, addressing, um, racial disparities in the criminal juvenile justice system. And, and I know arguably you might say that maybe some of that's not the quote unquote air quotes juvenile justice system, yet and still these um, data points in, re in real life, they have so much impact on these youth that at the, at the end of the day, uh, in, in, in many cases, they will, they will be lifelong 
these impacts on these youth. Okay. Um, so I think this, this is the place to have those conversations and to see if we can collaborate and figure out ways to reduce those because they don't seem to be going south. Okay. Excellent conversation. Thank you all. So, all right. Mark, thanks for that. Let us move to the last issue, which we have about 17 minutes to talk about. Um, if there's no objection. No? Okay. I was asked um, by, uh, well, I guess, the... the <laughs> The new Peggy Fleming, who's the um uh what's the term? Legislative assistant. I, I can never remember all the terms for joint judicial oversight. They have asked me to speak about the state of the RDAP a week from Thursday. You can imagine, given how I started this meeting when I was asked to do that, I was like overwhelmed with joy not what you would call happy joy, just kind of a more malicious joy. Um, one that will require me to sort of say to people, you know, angry black man is a bad trope. However, I am black and I'm not in a good mood, but I am raising my voice and that's only anger. It's another emotion, just like joy. Deal. Um, I have plenty to say, <laughs> um, mostly going back to what happened last session. Um, and part of it having to do with, constructively here, the fact that the what I was talking about earlier as the discontinuities between the constitution of this body and the legislature really becoming an impediment to the work that the RDAP can do and should do by statute. Um, I wanna bring this up with them. I brought it up in a uh, just kind of casual conversation about this time last year with Senator Sears, who was fascinated, really, really wanted to delve into that. And we all know he's gone. So that, isn't going to happen on that direction. However, that's why there's a group of people. <laughs> and I really feel like this needs to be brought up to them that this, you know, having a part-time legislature and in some ways a committee that uh, in panel that just doesn't meet very much. Um, what do we do? And now don't everyone get scared, but I'm like throwing ideas out. Like maybe we need to meet more. Maybe there needs to be a full RDAP and then a sub selection of the RDAP that does X, Y, Z, Q, and R. Um, I'm really wanting to throw the doors wide open on this because it's, bec it's been a problem uh, to a greater or lesser degree forever. And last session made me, I mean, you know, I'm not going to go into it again. You know where I was at. I mean, and I've already said it, what, 25 times in this meeting, um, that that just was, it was insupportable, simply insupportable. I mean, I, there's no other word for it. Um, particularly now that we have seen that this is already having results in BIPOC communities. Um, I think it's also important to bring up, and I will do this historically, if you all allow me, um, every time the United States starts talking about immigration, everyone freaks out about crime. Everyone starts freaking out about crime. And they do so by questioning numbers that before before the obsession about immigration, or as some would call it, primigration, the numbers that they trust every other time suddenly become faulty. 
So the FBI numbers, which tell us we're at a historic low with major crime as a nation, right? And the FBI cannot really be seriously thought of as a organization that is politicized to the progressive end of the spectrum. When they're saying that, there's something else going on there, right? It's not just an ideological position that's being taken. And there we are, and we're seeing it now. Or maybe we're seeing it now, but that's the point. The questions are posed, but they're not being answered. And they're not being answered because they are not calling in social justice groups. That's a problem. That's a problem. And all of this works together. All of this works together. The part-time legislature, the amount of time the RDAP meets, all of that, in my view, meshes perfectly with, with these situations that are historic in this country. Historic. Happened at the beginning of the 20th century when the Irish came in because they couldn't eat. They were starving. <laughs> they moved here. What's going on now? Oh, my. Look. All the people from countries that the United States has had some strange integration with um, are coming here. It's Latin America and it's Central America. I doubt anyone here has forgotten the Sandinistas, the Contras, Allende in Chile, all that. And now we're talking about crime again. And it's about to get really frightening because there are a bunch of people and it's all over the internet right now, who are, let, I don't know what to call anybody. I get yelled at no matter what I say. Latinx, Latino, Hispanic, I, I get yelled at. I'm sorry if I'm offending someone. I just, it's language in process and I'm in process with it. Um, but people are feeling like they're not under any, you know, there's nothing's going to happen to them if they're quote unquote good families. <clears throat> I really wonder how many other people have thought that throughout American history. So that's what I want to say. <laughs> I want to do a big, I've got 25 minutes, but I also want what you want me to say. I want your testimony on the state of the RDAP, and I'm not asking for it right now because I don't do this until a week from Thursday. But what I would like to ask you, and please make a note of what I'm about to say, by noon on the Wednesday before, so in other words, a week from tomorrow, by noon, please send me whatever you need me to say. You don't have to write a paragraph. Just do like bullet point, line, bullet point, line. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. I can work from that. But I want to hear from everybody from whom I need to hear. I know what I want to say, but you may not want me to say that. So you need to tell me. And Susanna, right. Thank you, Susanna. By noon on Wednesday the 20th, send ENL what you want him to say at the Joint Justice Ray, the state of the RDAP. That's it. Now, what I would like to know from the members, is anyone, does anyone wa not want me to say what I just gave you a praises of? I'm not going to take it personally. I have no feelings anymore. I'm over 60. Okay, I will go, I will charge ahead. I will make my slides. I will do that, but I need to hear. Yes, you know, Mark, thank you for putting that in there. Vermont, safest state in the nation, Burlington's safest town. Yeah, I saw that too. Um, and yet, <laughs> and yet, you know, we should all be packing. I mean, I it, it's a little schizophrenic. Um, and that in that context, not to call in 
testimony from groups who are made to watch this is kind of criminal. You want to talk about crime? I mean, I don't want to go way over to, you know, like crazy land here, but there's a problem with that. And there's a problem with that if we start seeing impacts, and we are. And we are. I mean, Maybe we shouldn't tell you what to say because I'm appreciating this unscripted version instead. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, you know, I'll make some notes so I don't go floating off into, you know, left field. But that's, that's what I, I mean, I want, you know, to say it um, because I think this has to be done. I think that, you know, they're, they're used to hearing, oh, the RDAP's doing just fine. No, we're not. No, we're not. I'm the chair. It's my responsibility to know as much about this body as I can. And that's what I want to portray or what I want to put forth for them. So, okay. Please get me whatever you want. I'll send out an email uh, tomorrow, just reminding everybody to get something into me. Um, cause I've got a conference women in law enforcement this end of the week that I'm going to. So, um, I won't be around to talk. Um, I'm going to sit around and listen, which I love. So that's all I have to say there. Anything else? Okay. Um, otherwise, any new business that, well, we brought up a lot of new business. We brought up a whole lot of new business. That's good, actually. But does anyone have any more that they would like to bring up that we would put on the, oh, thank you, Mark. I'll look at it later. Um, anybody have anything else they want me to put down for? on the agenda for next time, something that needs to be done, anything of that sort. You don't have to know it now. I'm just, you know, we've got a month. <laughs> so, okay. Please do be in touch when you Tom. get ideas. <clears throat> hey, Tom. Yes. Is, is there any way that, um, I'm sorry, this is actually for you, Tyler. Is there any way we can get trending data on, on that report that I just dropped? So that, I mean, that report comes from us, obviously, that was Elizabeth. We don't have that position filled right now since she's moved on, but we'll continue to generate those report out. Um, maybe you and I can have an offline conversation about what trending data would look like, how frequent. A lot of this requires heavy manual tabulation and relying on databases mm -hmm. that are outside of DCF. Um, so we do what we can, but but yeah, I'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And and but what I'd like more to, than that is just to, that that data find its way back to this body. So I let's yeah. do both. Um, Elizabeth will... has shared that she she's always brought this to this body. We've done a couple times. Yeah, I'm not... yeah, I'm 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 completely aware of that. I, I don't. Okay. I just, I've just I've never seen I've never seen the data trending. But what I mean is, is that what we, what I have seen is, is I've seen reports on a regular basis. Um, and what it would take to trend that data is just simply just side by side, year after year. Let's see, let's see, let's see 15, let's see 16, let's see 17. Because mm, why we gotcha. collect data, we collect data so we can benchmark, so we can measure, and so we can inform our mitigation strategy. It doesn't help us just to look at a report and just get a glimpse every year where mm -hmm. we're coming from and where we're going so we can figure out how to get there. That's a good point, Mark. Thank you. Is that all right? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> God, I don't know what's gotten in my throat. Anyway, that'll keep this short. Next meeting, 10th of December, 2024. See you back here at that point. Um, do be in touch. I will send an email tomorrow. And I'm ready to adjourn. And usually we get all Robert's rules of order. Let's not. Anybody have any problem with stopping talking now? I like that version of Robert's. 
nobody has an issue with stopping talking now. Have a lovely evening, all of you. Thank you so much for your work. You guys are so much fun to work with. I love you. You all think I just say that. I'm not just saying that. I really mean it. It's really fun. Anyway, I will talk with you all next month, if not before. Look forward to your thoughts for Joint Judicial Oversight. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, John. Bye. 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 Bye.